Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Robotics 101 webinar, an introduction to robotics for manufacturing. My name is Matt Minner. I'm a senior consultant uh, with technical services at Catalyst Connection. Uh, we're located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the southwest portion of the, the, the state. And along with me, I have Raminder Sandhu from California Manufacturing Technology Center, CMTC, who's the, who's the robotics practice lead. And uh, we'd like to welcome you today to the webinar. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, and just a, a note, you know, everyone is in, in listen-only mode, but you know, feel free as the presentation goes along, if you have questions, to send them into the, uh, the chat function, and we'll, we'll save some time for questions at the end. So what we're going to talk about today, that's what we all, all want to know, uh, robotics and manufacturing, and we're going to hit the, a little bit of the why and the how. So you know, why would we consider robotics? And you can even extend that to technology in general and in manufacturing, as well as the how. And what are the tools and the, the considerations to, to doing so? Next, uh, we'll talk a little bit of the differentiate between uh, cobot or collaborative robotics and traditional robotics, and you know, give you an idea to help you figure out what might be uh, right for your particular applications that you may be considering. Uh, next, we'll take a look at some practical applications, and that hopefully will help you identify some opportunities that you may want to look into further. And then we'll we'll wrap up by sharing a little bit about the MEP resources and support uh, that we we have to offer, just for for your awareness. So, first off. Uh, the MEP National Network, that's where uh, both uh, Reminder and I uh, work at, and you'll see uh, we have uh, over 50 centers uh, around the country, and it's uh, part of the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, all focused on supporting small and medium manufacturing. It's a public-private partnership. It sees uh, federal funding through NIST, and many states have uh, state funding sources as well. And uh, again, you know, our, our sole focus is supporting small and medium manufacturing in our uh, relative areas, and uh, you'll notice four of the centers there, Pennsylvania and the uh, CMTC in yellow, as well as Impact Washington and Fuse Hub in New York. And uh, these centers are highlighted because uh, along with Reminder and I, we have two colleagues from the other two centers uh, that have been part of a project connecting the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, MEP Network, with Manufacturing USA, which is another map you see on the right side of the screen. Uh, manufacturing USA is a network of manufacturing institutes that focus on advancing manufacturing technologies. And in the case of, of our four MEPs, we have been uh, working together with ARM, Advanced Robotics for Manufacturing Institute, uh, which actually just happens to be located directly below me where I sit here in Pittsburgh. Uh, but they are a national organization, you know, all focused on developing the technology and workforce initiatives to help drive uh, adoption of robotics and just uh, propel U.S. manufacturing forward. So, you know, we're here talking about robotics, but why would that uh, even be something we would consider? And uh, like I said, you can almost extend that to many different technologies in, in manufacturing, but uh, so for robotics, the main one of the the main things you'll hear quite often are you know the three D's the dull the dirty the dangerous and if you think dull just think of those repetitive tasks where the you know you have a human operator today doing the same task over and over again all day long so dull boring work um, and you know just really not ideal for for human operators along with the dirty and dangerous. So then you start having some whether it's health and safety concerns. Um, so you know, again, not ideal conditions for human operators, but those are great um, opportunities for robotics and things to to consider uh, from a production bottleneck standpoint. You know, one good example that we see often uh, with a lot of our metal fabrication uh, clients is making the transition from CO2 lasers which, you know, quite often cutting was their bottleneck in the production process. 
and then transitioning to fiber lasers, which are just this step change in production, and especially when you combine that with these you know, automated towers and other systems that really allow them to produce and have tons of work in process, and now it pushes their bottlenecks into other um, other areas, a lot of the, the processing, you know, welding, assembly, forming, all of which you know, create opportunities for robotics to uh, expand production using you know your existing workforce, and you know, a number of other aspects uh, from part traceability or needing to verify date and light lock codes uh, to the high precision and high dexterity tasks where robotics really excels because of their precision and the areas where humans just you know really don't uh, you know, aren't able to do that as well. And uh, we already talked to the, the health and safety, uh, et cetera. Um, but that's, you know, that's a big one. Those can be the most impactful applications that can improve the quality of work, uh, you know, the work conditions for your employees, you know, make them you know, take away those tasks that you have a hard time filling. You know, you have enough, hard enough time finding skilled workers, let alone for the undesirable tasks. Uh, and then, you know, finally, multiple shifts that you're able to just take, you know, a potential investment and spread it that much further. Uh, so, you know, a lot of different reasons to, to consider robotics. Uh, so anything else so, that you'd like to add? Yeah, Matt, yeah, if I could just add a couple of things. So what we typically consider initially for robotics applications are those high volume uh, processes. So when you're making hundreds of thousands of parts per year and you're, you're having high speed, high volume, that's where robots really excel. Another way, uh, the core layer of that is what I call long duration tasks. So that could be, uh, say you're welding um, parts uh, on an I-beam, for example, and it may be three or four hours to complete the weld of that entire part or a fuselage on an aircraft. There may be riveting applications or something where um, th these aren't by any means high volume industries. If we think about uh, structural steel or aerospace, However, there are certain tasks, uh, grinding, deburring, polishing, welding, where uh, it takes a long time to complete that process. And those are also areas where um, robotics can lend itself and uh, be very useful. And uh, those are great applications for robots. And the other one, of course, just to reiterate, um, can't emphasize enough health and safety, uh, getting your workers away from toxic fumes or uh, get, you know, if you're in a boundary or you have furnaces, getting them away from uncomfortable environments. So all those areas are, are great applications where you want to look at automating and getting people away from those difficult tasks. Great. Thanks, Reminder. So that was talking a little bit of the, the why. You know, it's a, obviously a, a pretty brief overview of the why, but I think uh, a lot of them, you know, resonate quite a bit with, with manufacturers and they can, you know, identify a task or two or a few things, man, it would be great if we could, uh, you know, automate that or even just a portion of it uh, to reduce the burden on our on our existing workforce. So I want to talk a little bit about the how. So the, the tools in our toolbox, so to speak. We've got four uh, typical types of robotics uh, from the articulated robot arm, the delta and parallel are sometimes called spider robots, scare units, and Cartesian, sometimes called gantry robots. And each of them have advantages and disadvantages and some typical applications, and we'll, we'll talk through that now. The articulated robot, that's when, when most people think of, you know, hear the word robot, that, that's typically what uh, folks are thinking of. You know, the, big automotive assembly line with many, many robots going to town, uh, welding on frames, et cetera. And so that's, uh, you know, the real typical robot. Um, you know, they would be dictated or, excuse me, referred to by their degrees of freedom. So you typically, uh, you know, a fixed axis articulated robot arm is, is pretty typical. And, you know, these are six axes of, of rotation for all the, the different joints. Sometimes you even get, you know, get seven axis robots, which a lot of times uh, give a, a little, you know, that one to extra degree of freedom to do machine tending applications where you have to reach in or around uh, objects, but we'll get to that. Um, but you can see, if you know, you know, we got almost uh, over two, you know, two plus lines of potential applications. 
so this by far is the widest um, flexibility in terms of application. You can call it a uh, jack of all trades and master of some. You know, it's, there's a few of them where it certainly would be the, the best suited, but it can do just about everything. And a lot of those reasons it can is because of the flex flexibility and dexterity that just the, the geometry and the nature of the uh, of the robot provides. The mounting, you know, right here you see it mounted just on a, a horizontal surface, but that can it doesn't have to be. It can, you can mount it from the ceiling if you wanted to. Put it off of a wall to, you know, reach over a conveyor or some other workspace. Even mounted on a mobile cart. You know, we have clients who have fabricated up their own wheeled carts uh, to really up the flexibility and literally take it from one workstation to another. And that's, you know, one of the benefits of collaborative robots that we'll, we'll talk about here soon. Uh, just uh, a lot of flexibility in mounting. You know, reach and payload has a really wide range from very small to the largest robots in the world capable of lifting, you know, 2,000 or more kilograms. Uh, so a, a couple tons. Uh, the downside, you know, all the flexibility and dexterity that you do get, you know, comes at a cost. The precision, you know, can degrade as you operate in the, the max zone, so to speak. So when you're at the, the, the farthest extents of the reach and the maximum payloads, especially at the same time, uh, precision you know, tends to degrade. And then you see speed there, which seems a little uh, counterintuitive when you're talking about robotics and seeing speed as a negative. I say relative speed, because uh, compared to other robots um, that really excel when it comes to high-speed applications, this, you know, articulated do not excel in that same fashion, but are, are certainly fast in their own right. The next act we'll talk about is a Cartesian robot, and as I mentioned before, called a gantry robot. Uh, you see a smaller list of potential applications, um, but you know, still for those that it, that it does, it is particularly well suited. Uh, the positives is it's it's a custom robot. You really are piecing together off-the-shelf uh, componentry to create whatever range of motion that your application needs. And as such, the cost can be um, more affordable compared to similar capacity robots, just because you are using a lot of off-the-shelf componentry. Reach and payload, you know, likewise, can whatever uh, linear actuators are used, you, know, you can really um, do really high payloads and do some pretty unique applications. And you know, the footprint, you see, it's um, the frame that supports it can be, you know, pretty um, pretty small in footprint or even be suspended. Uh, so you know, really allows a lot of flexibility. The downside. The dexterity, just because of the again the nature of this type of robot, that it's all except for what may be in the the wrist joint area, is linear actuator. So moving in a straight line in one direction or the other uh, doesn't allow for you know, reaching into compartments. So say for machine tending, where you're actually pulling parts in and out of a you know, CNC mill, for example, this would not be uh, their um, ideal application. That would not be something you do with the Cartesian for the most part. On uh, the other end, because of kind of the opposite side or the other side of the coin from custom, is doing it yourself can be a bit of a challenge, uh, especially for those who are you know looking to take advantage of the ease of use of a lot of collaborative robots. This would not be in the, the same category per se. Uh, it would take a, a lot more expertise uh, to do design and install one of these robots yourself. And that covers that. Um, the, the scare, which is another unique style of robot, uh, called the selectively compliant articulated robot arm. And it's a, a bit of a, a mouthful, but essentially just if you look at uh, each of the joints, you have uh, two joints coming off the, actually I'm not sure if you see my cursor here, oh, yeah, just the, the two joints coming off the mounting pedestal here, you have two rotational joints and then one linear joint. So in each of those joints, the compliance is moving in, in one or two directions max. So that you know, makes it excel when you have vertical assembly applications, things of that nature, um, you know, pick in place inspection or dispensing applications. And where these really excel is speed and precision. 
they are really very fast and you have a small footprint and, and can be reasonably uh, priced as well compared to similar capacity robots. The downside, they do have a pretty limited range of reach and payload. Uh, and as we talked, you know, the dexterity, one of the things that gives them an advantage of having very high precision, especially in that vertical direction, you know, they have less dexterity and it is a, a fixed motion path that they follow. Yeah, um, Matt, just to add uh, real quickly on the mascara robot. So they're great for uh, applications like screw driving or for pick and place. So you have a very rapid, fast movement in the X and Y plane. And then you have that C axis uh, vertically. It's a rigid axis, but it's good for those types of applications I mentioned. And we'll get into some of those applications later on in, in my section. Excellent, excellent. Okay, now the, the last of the four types we're, we're talking about is the, the Delta or parallel robot, also called spider robots. Now, if they say the SCARA seemed, or, uh, seemed purpose built, the, the Delta and parallel is you know, even more so. You see even shorter list of uh, potential applications. You, you know, when you think these types of robots, you're thinking high speed packaging, high speed you know, assemblies or inspection. Um, because you know part of that is just the way they're designed. That was exactly what they were were built for. Uh, you see the the three pods at the the top or here at the base of the robot. And that's actually where all the actuators are held. Uh, so that makes the linkage to actually move the end effector extremely lightweight. Uh, so just through the the kinematics, you know, the way the joints move and the linkage makes it extremely fast. Really high accelerations and high speeds. So that is where it excels with you know, low payloads at the same time. Uh, so on the, the downside, you know, the reach it really is just in a circular area directly below the, the robot. Uh, and as we talked, lower payloads and you know, they're really very purpose built. So they don't have the same extent of flexibility and you know, mounting, it's you know, always ceiling on it. It's 10 or nine times out of 10. Uh, if you're seeing one of these robots, it's mounted above a conveyor and there's probably more right next to it to uh, you know help with the task that it's, that it's going after. Um, and lastly, just um, not a, a major uh, con when it comes to the applications that you're trying to go after, but you know they can have some additional maintenance to, to be aware of or just with the, the moving linkages. Uh, but you know, they excel at the applications they're suited for. And that's just a, a chart to, to help remember what the the key aspects of the four different types of robots, and you see where they excel uh, from you know, the aspects of the application, whether you're looking for high speed or high payloads or precision or dexterity are more critical. You know, see where most of the, the robots fall out, where they you know, have one or two where they excel most and you know others where they're less suited and you know, again, the, the articulated arm can, you know, you could, you know, make space for some of the other, depending on the application of it, still, you know, kind of checking that high speed and, and high precision box, but that's, you know, really where things shake out here, just to give you a, a general idea of uh, the best suited applications. Okay, so that was really just talking through the, the tools in the toolbox, as we, as we mentioned. And now an additional layer above that technology is the idea of collaborative robots. That's what we're referring to as, as cobots previously. And the whole idea there, as the name implies, is they're able to collaborate with or in close proximity to human operators. Um, you know, and the way they do this is through, you know, the software and the sensing capabilities that they have for identifying when an obstruction has been uh, hit by either feeling the force or noting that their movement has been impeded from where they expect it to be. Uh, so that's a, a lot of how it goes uh, and it creates a collaborative function. Uh, and also just by operating at lower payloads and speeds, you know, historically and that's a pretty short window, and then which uh, over the past five years or so, remember that uh, collaborative robots have become more prevalent. Yeah, yeah, I'd say that's about right. Yeah, so it's uh, 
historically in that period, you know, they typically topped out payload right around, you know, 10 to 15 kilograms or so about, you know, 20, 25 pounds. Um, but that is starting to increase, you know, you're seeing additional entrance to, to the market. And so that, that's starting to change, but still in general, there will be lower payloads and speeds as compared to traditional robots. Now, one key point that we want to, to stress is the robot, that is, it's a collaborative robot and it always will be. Uh, but the real question that you have to consider is, is your application collaborative? You never taking a, a robot out of the box and using it as is. You're always adding end effectors. You're working with work pieces in a work cell with other tools and hardware. So that's really where the risk assessment comes in and I'm truly understanding how collaborative the application is. You know, as soon as you add a, so a sharp or a hot end effector, or working with a workpiece that has burrs or is also hot itself or many different factors or possibilities, uh, that's really where they may be collaborative, but you really have to do a complete risk assessment to understand uh, the application as a whole. Some of the other benefits that collaborative robots have, you know, their user interface is really intended um, for those, you know, without programming experience, so they're really user-friendly and intuitive, and due to some of the, depending on the applications, when you're able to install with less safety guarding, you're able to achieve implementations that typically a lower cost, easier to implement, leading to a faster return on the investment that you're making. Um, but, you know, again, it's the application that dictates how complex that integration will be. You know, a given application will require the same integration, whether it's a collaborative robot or an industrial robot or a, or a traditional robot. So that's, you know, there's also something to keep in mind. Uh, but they are a, a great uh, first step into robotics. Yeah, and that, I uh, just wanted to add, um, you know, what you mentioned about safety, that, that is key. We, we're looking at an application once where the, the client was considering uh, picking and placing sheet metal they have uh, one foot square pieces of sheet metal they were going to move around with a collaborative robot and so the issue is that you know the very sharp edges and you know you do have to consider what you are moving around because that makes all the difference in the world uh, you definitely didn't want an operator close by there when the robot's swinging around that piece of sheet metal so that is key in whether or not the application is actually one that lends itself to a collaborative robot yeah, absolutely. Thanks for being there. Now, the last slide we'll we'll get here to just talk further about uh, collaborative robots versus traditional robots. This uh, got a little bit of a comparison here. You know, for starters, you can see in the picture there, you know, one gentleman's pushing his collaborative robot on a cart. You know, he's you know it's so much so that it's able to move from one cell to another. And he just sets it up as work conditions and as you know, workforce needs dictate as compared to more of a, a large fixed installation, you know, typically not moving around traditional robotics in that fashion because they're going to have safety guarding or have a, a dedicated cell. So not only making them fixed, but also, you know, increasing the, uh, you know, the investment that's typically needed. Um, but then again, back to, you know, you've got high speed, high volume with that traditional robot cell. You're looking at speeds similar to human, if not a little slower than a human with a cobot. And where you make up for that, because that may sound like, oh, it's slower than human. Why would I even consider that? Well, robots don't need to take bunch breaks. They don't have to, you know, have you know, other breaks or, you know, don't, uh, you know, get sick. They're there and able to operate, you know, so right off the bat there, you can potentially see, you know, so, you know 15, 20% or more just with the lack of uh, the need for, for breaks that you're able to augment your, your production in that sense. Um, so then just the, the fast setup and the ease of use compared with some of the complexities that have typically come with uh, industrial robotics, uh, the difference between the reach and payload, and you know just the, the overall cost. So that's some of the other factors are in the differences between cobots and robots. Uh, so that kind of concludes the portion where we talk about our 
our tools, but now let's start looking at, well, how do you use them? What are some uh, typical applications? Um, actually, before we, we do that, I think, Reminder, you have uh, anything else to add here in our cobot Yeah, just robot? a couple of points. Um, you know, for applications where you, you consider a collaborative robot are typically lower, lower payload, you know, a small light object you're moving around, and lower speeds. Now, if you have a, a need for a real high-speed robot, that's not going to be a collaborative robot. They're not designed for that. And uh, just by way of illustrating that, the typical uh, now with Fanuc's latest family of robots, the design life is 100,000 hours. So they are designed to run these robots to run continuously for 100,000 hours versus a coll the collaborative robots that are on the market today, the design life is around 25,000 hours. So that kind of gives you an idea of the, the, the difference in uh, design and durability and what the different robots are the applications that they're meant for. Uh, when the collaborative robots first came out, uh, they were implemented in some high-speed applications, and they had a lot of failures in the field uh, with bearings and some of the joints. And so they have been continuing to improve the designs and make them more uh, reliable and robust, but uh, they're still really meant for lower speed applications. So that's probably one of the biggest things to consider. Just the nature of being collaborative and being around human operators, they aren't meant to operate at, at typical robot speeds where the arm's really swinging around. Uh, that was the main thing I wanted to just talk about the difference in how they're meant to be applied. I think that, that's a great addition. Thanks, Reminder. And so I'll, I'll hand it over to you and, and talk through some robotics applications. Okay, now we've uh, we've wrapped up the kind of a, what I'd call the theory part of this uh, presentation. I want to talk a little bit about practical industrial applications, and um, hopefully those of you who are in attendance will be able to consider, you know, what we've talked about on these different applications and how we can apply these how we can apply these robots for different uh, processes that you may have on your factory floor. Now, the application that we're showing here is a pick and place. It's a packaging application. It's food packaging. In particular, we happen to be using an articulated arm here. Uh, usually, you'll see these uh, with uh, either Scara or uh, one of the Delta robots, and I'll show some of those examples as well. So let's move on to the next slide, and I'll show some other applications. Uh, the left is probably the most famous uh, industrial robot application. It's uh, welding in an automotive plant. Uh, they're not showing it here, but oftentimes you'll have one robot actually holding the chassis and moving it around while the other robot performs all the welds. So this is an example of what I was talking about before, where this isn't a high volume production process, but it is a long duration task. And this is something where you know robots are well suited. On the right is another welding application for a large um, steel uh, member, for a structural steel type of member. Uh, we can go on to the next one. Another application where articulated arms are well suited is what I call finishing applications. Uh, finishing includes deburring, polishing, sanding, uh, any of those types of uh, end end of line processes that need to be performed on a part, typically metal parts. Uh, so the, the nature of articulated arms with their reach and their versatility and able to, being able to get into those nooks and crannies really lend itself to these types of applications. Here, this is a, a deburring wheel that's being used on an automotive uh, a wheel part. There's another one, uh, painting a, doesn't, it's not normally defined as a finishing application, but I think of it as in that family. It's a similar type of uh, robot motion, and they're typically always done with articulated arms just because they're able to reach around to all the parts. And one of the things I wanted to point out here, we talked earlier about when you want to implement robots, and health and safety is one of the key areas where robots will give you a great return. Um, so if you have manual operators that are in a paint booth wearing respirators and applying paint, uh, that's something that, if possible, you want to get those human operators away from those types of tasks. If they're painting or if they're uh, handling toxic chemicals or any types of other harmful uh, components in your process, we will want to automate those processes. 
And this is where robots really can shine and uh, give you a great return. So this kind of things, if you are, any of you out there in the audience who are working in uh, production operations, if you have these types of processes and they're not automated, uh, talk to your, your local MEP center and they can help you look at whether it makes sense to add robotics for these processes. Uh, the next one is assembly and uh, on the left, uh, this is a good example of the versatility of the articulated arm. This, uh, the image on the left isn't an actual industrial application, but it's a, a research project at a university. And they're showing coordinated motion between two robots. This is very common. It's really straightforward to do with the robot, through the robot controller and the software. But what they're showing, I wanted to show with this image is I just like it because it shows the reach and uh, the ability of the robots to get at all these places. And uh, they, this particular research research project was uh, doing a I IKEA type furniture assembly with automation and showing that it can be done. Um, so that's one application where we can use uh, articulated arms for assembly. We often see scare robots used for assembly uh, with the if it's the right type of part. On the right, you'll see printed circuit boards, a, a surface mount where these uh, scare robots are acquiring parts off a moving conveyor and then mounting them on the surface of the printed circuit boards. Uh, this type of application, a pick and place type assembly application and screw driving, as I mentioned earlier, those are both excellent applications for scare robots just because of the nature of the geometry where they can move quickly in X and Y and they have that rigid vertical Z axis. So packaging application, or in this case, conveyor tracking, uh, this is where you'd want to use a scale, a SCARA on the right or a, a parallel a delta robot on the left. Uh, for conveyor tracking, what we want to do is we have a, a machine vision system mounted over a conveyor belt, and it's acquiring images of these parts as they go by. So we're getting position and orientation information for each part, and then after the the camera has acquired the image, sends that information to the robot, and the robot's tracking the movement of the conveyor and picking up these parts and then packaging them. It's a very common uh, high-speed application that we see uh, typically in food packaging as these parts are coming out of, a, of an oven or some other type of process, uh, food processing process. Um, so that's a great application for a Delta robot. Since it's up above. It's designed to be mounted above conveyors. And you could also do this application with a SCARA robot. And on the right, we're seeing another packaging application where we're picking parts off the conveyor and placing them in boxes. Yeah, I'm ready for the next one. Okay, thank you. Uh, dispensing is another area where we see it. it's a quite often where we're seeing robot applications on the left. Cartesian robots are well suited for this because you can have most of the robot mechanism up out of the way. Uh, you, you can't see the conveyor in this picture, but you'd have parts coming in on a conveyor or some other type of mechanism. The dispensing process is done and the parts keep going on. On the right, where there's a scare robot. In this case, uh, we talked about the vers versatility of an articulated arm. They would also be well suited for dispensing because typically these aren't high speed applications. So that's where, again, Articulated arm would work, uh, but we typically see either Cartesian or SCARE robots used in this case for dispensing applications. Okay. Okay, machine tending. And machine tending is getting a lot of buzz now and somewhat has tracked uh, the, the buzz around collaborative robots. Uh, in this case, we'd, you'd always want to use an articulated arm. Uh, machine tending, from most of the applications, all the ones that I've seen at least, you have the robot's going to have to reach in and out of some kind of cavity, whether it's a CNC machine or an oven or some other kinds of process where you have to place a part inside of an enclosure. Um, the articulated arm, the, based on the geometry of it and the way it's able to reach in things, it's uh, very well suited for this. So. If you have a machine tending application, most likely you're going to use an articulated arm uh, because of the geometry. The other nice thing about this robot, the versatility of the joints, it allows it to actually, you can, it can push all the buttons on the control panel 
to turn on and off process on the machine. You can grip the door handle of the door of your device, uh, in, case, in this case, like CNC door. It can open the door, place the part in, close the door, press the start button. can do all of the tasks that a human operator could do. You can accomplish with an articulated arm. Uh, another thing on, on this image, and we'll get into this in a little more detail, is that if you are considering automating with a robot, one of the things to bear in mind is that once you've added that robot to your work cell, now you have to figure out how you're going to present the parts to the robot. Um, unlike a human operator, you can take a bin of parts, throw the parts in a bin, the, the human operator can pick up uh, the blanks out of the bin and place them in the CNC machine. Uh, a robot typically will need some kind of fixturing, uh, a part magazine or some other method of presenting the parts to a robot in a manner that it can easily acquire each part uh, reliably each time. Um, there has been a lot of work on bin picking uh, with using machine vision to pick up parts that are in a pile in a bin. Uh, that technology is still, it's an, uh, what I'd call an immature technology. It has been implemented, but it's still in the very early stages. So it's yet to be proven to be a reliable, robust technology. Uh, it's still just kind of getting started. Did you have anything you wanted to add to this, Matt? Yeah, I think and along the lines, I think the bin picking is a, uh, a a good example too of you know kind of the different levels of you know where you can you know you install a robot cell on day one and it doesn't mean it's going to always be the same. You know, a lot of times you start what's that that first step in getting something installed and maybe at first it's a, a tray like you see here a fixture and it's sticking out of the fixture. Then you know maybe it moves on to you know, another system, you know, it's constantly evolving because, you know, the, the advantage with a fixture like this is the robot doesn't need to see it. It knows you can program in, work through a raise, and you have it in a set spot. It knows where it's going to be, so it can just go there as opposed to, you know, like when you get to that level of bin picking, now there's an additional level of perception that's required, you know, adding vision systems, additional integration, i.e. additional cost. So there can always be a progressive approach uh, for um, robotics installations where you start at kind of one level and then you know, work your way up. Um, you know, and I think the other aspect along those lines, you don't always have to automate 100% of a process. It's hard to see what may be the case just with these photos, but you know, think into that grinding cell or the, the buffing one, you know, there could be you, know, you do 80% of the work, so it takes some of the, the taxing work off the human operator, but maybe they still come in to do the final inspection and final touch-up. So there's that consideration, too, of not just what application, but maybe how much of it. Uh, so just a, a couple other thoughts in, in that respect. Now, that's a great point. And, you know, back to the uh, – well, it reminds me of a couple of things. Yeah, for the, for, the grind, for the finishing applications, if you're doing a polishing or deburring or sanding, type of process and it's a long duration process. Yeah, that's a good point. Maybe you can do 80%, 80, 90% of the work. Um, say you have a big fiberglass panel uh, for an automotive application. You can do 90% of the, the sanding with a robot. And then the last, the inspection, the last 10, 20%, you come in with a human operator. And again, the, the great thing about that is you really limit the human exposure to the dust and the other contaminants that are released when you're doing those types of finishing applications. Um, so it's a kind of a win-win. Uh, one thing that Matt, you reminded me with the fixturing, uh, if we could just go back to that last image, uh, you know, in this case, you have an eight by eight array of parts. And the nice thing about this fixture, if it's well designed, you don't need any additional sensing for the robot. You, as you mentioned, you don't need a vision system to locate those parts. You can just turn the robot, you could load up the magazine, and you're going to assume all 64 parts are there and it, have the robot run through that cycle, of picking up each part, placing it in the CNC machine, and then putting the finished part in an output tray. Um, that greatly simplifies your overall, uh, your overall application and the time it takes to implement it. So those are some considerations we'll get into in more detail, but uh, that, that are very different when you're looking at human operators versus uh, a robot and how much you have to prepare the parts for the robot to be able to work with them. Uh, 
Uh, the next application we're going to talk about is palletizing. This is another very common application for robots. It's uh, starting to see a lot more use worldwide. And typically, we'll only see articulated arms and Cartesian robots for this application. Uh, and that's because of the reach and the payload for the most of these. Both of these are both high reach, high payload uh, robot designs. Uh, the, you know, an articulated arm can typically, it's very common to see articulated arm robots with payloads of 25 kilograms, even up to 100, 200, you know, as Matt mentioned, 2,000 kilograms. Uh, so, you know, if you have these large, whether it's uh, large boxes or, or bags of material, whatever it may be, uh, design, you get the right end defector designed to acquire the part. Um, this is a very straightforward application for a robot. Uh, on the right, uh, just wanted to mention uh, for a Cartesian or we call it a gantry robot, uh, again, the robot, the mechanism itself is up out of the way. It's above the work envelope. Uh, so it really lends itself to building conveyors and other things to build, bring the parts underneath. And then it's easy for it to acquire these large, these are heavy, you know, 75 pound rolls of film, uh, something that's a very well suited for these types of pick and place applications in, in the palletizing world. Yeah, and, and just to note that as we were talking earlier on the Cartesian, you know, just look at the, the scale of, of that robot, you know, maybe, you know, a lot larger than you may even have thought that Cartesians would would get, but, you know, essentially, you know, a small bridge crane that, that it's it's working with. So they, they really, you know, the custom nature and, and the capabilities, I think, are really on display there. I mentioned conveyor tracking earlier. This is another, just an, another few examples. It's very common in food packaging, um, electronics, other types of consumer goods packaging, where we see a lot of parts on uh, being moved around the plant floor on a conveyor, then they have to be packaged. So um, if you remember what we talked about the different arms, there's two types that are great for these applications, the delta robots and the stero robots. And they're very fast in the X and Y plane, and they're, they're made to pick up parts in Z and quickly deposit them. So uh, at this point, you should uh, it, it should be pretty clear to everyone and evident that these are Great. This is a this is a scare and delta robot area. As a contrast to the previous one of palletizing, which is more of an articulated arm and Cartesian area. So to to summarize, uh, just what we're talking about, um, Matt had originally spoken about the articulated arm and the jack jack of all trades and master of some, and you can see that in that left column. Um, it is the it is a highly versatile robotics design. It's not the fastest robot, um, doesn't have the highest payload. It is high payload, not the highest, uh, but it's, it is adequate for most of your applications. So uh, that's where you'll see that with, with this uh, graphic here. Uh, for most high speed, low payload applications, you're gonna look, you're gonna want either a Scara or a Delta robot. And finally, the Cartesian uh, mechanisms, typically higher payloads, um, they can be fairly precise, but typically higher payloads, uh, usually lower speed applications are where the Cartesian gantry mechanisms will be most ubiquitous. Uh, yeah. So when we're talking about implementing robots, uh, people who are, ha if you haven't done a robot implementation before, it, it can be, it can be easy to underestimate the complexity of the task. Now, the robots can be very well designed. Robots have been around since, have been used in industrial applications since the 70s. So it's, you know, we're looking at close to 50 year old technology. However, it's the end effectors where most of the complexity comes in. And that's where, you know, you have to take careful consideration of whether a robot is right for this application. You know, we think about what robots are doing. They're, emulating human tasks. Machine vision emulates human vision. Uh, robots emulate human motion of picking and placing and manipulating objects. Uh, however, you know, in spite of all the technology we have available to us today, we're, we, we haven't come up with anything close to the versatility and dexterity of a human hand. 
you think about it, you can you can pick up a piece of paper, you can pick up a needle, you can pick up a brick, you can pick up a bag of saline solution. All of those things are very easy and straightforward for a human operator to do. Now, if you asked a robot to do those four those four tasks, there's there's there doesn't exist today a single robot gripper that can accomplish all of that. So just that just gives you an idea of uh, the consideration needed for uh, end effector design. It's it's crucial and vital. Uh, there's a lot of there are a lot of different um, alternatives for solving those types of problems. There's quick change end effectors that can be that the robot can change out itself as it's working depending on what the application is. There's a two and three up end effectors where depending on uh, how the end effector is, which direction it's it's pointed, you'll you'll give you different capabilities. But that is something to consider as we get to really simulate the versatility of the human hand and the ability of uh, humans to sense what they're holding and and how much. Uh, a great a great example of that is like when you pick up an egg. Uh, you know, a, a human being would never pick up an egg and just crush it because it's applying too much force to it. Your your hands are are in a constant feedback loop, sensing how much uh, force you're applying to an object, allowing it to slip just slightly. Just there's small micro slips that your hand is allowing to do, so that you're not exerting too much force, you're not wasting energy picking it up, but you're applying just some, enough force to the object that it doesn't fall out of your grip, and not too much to crush the object. So we haven't been able to duplicate that that high speed closed loop uh, feedback mechanism with robot grippers yet. They're, there's a lot of research being done around that now, but uh, that technology hasn't isn't out there yet. So this is something uh, can't really emphasize enough. It's a key component of when you are designing a robot work cell is end effector design. Is there anything you wanted to add to that, Matt? No, I I think you you hit it, Reminder. And so you know, really, it's the the robot is the kind of the, the easy part. Um, it's everything that starting with the the end effector and moving on to everything around it, because you're not going to have that in a bubble. It's going to be in a cell, uh, working with other hardware and tooling and sensors. And, you know, as you start to see this, you can start to understand why, the, you know, typically you look at the, the cost of a robotic implementation, and it's, you know, two to three plus times the cost of the, the robot hardware itself uh, because of all these different factors and all these different considerations. Uh, so that's you know it's it's not just the the robot it's just the whole cell. Yeah, exactly. And, okay, and that's a real that's a key uh, a thing to consider. Is like let's say you have a fifty thousand dollar robot, the hardware itself, the robot and the controller, you know, the robot sales guy comes out and says, yeah, this is a fifty thousand dollar piece of equipment. You know, when it's all said and done, once you've added all the sensors, once you've had a systems integrator, or you've done the programming yourself, and you've written the code for the robot. Um, so maybe you've added a vision system. You're definitely going to need to add some type of mechanism to feed parts to the robot, whether it's a, a flexible feeder or a vibratory bowl feeder or conveyors. Um, you're going to need some sensors to tell the robot that parts in a position ready to be picked up. Uh, then there's the end effector to sign. What type of end effector are you going to use? A communication with the rest of, with the other equipment on your floor. All, all, once you've considered all of these, Easily, you can triple your budget. Uh, so, you, so your fifty thousand dollar robot is has suddenly become a hundred and fifty thousand dollar robot work cell once it's all once it's been properly programmed and all the equipment has been installed around it to allow the robot to do its job. Okay. Well, you know, just before we, we wrap up our webinar here and take a, a few questions, um, just wanted to highlight from a, an MEP standpoint in the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, the resources that a lot of MEPs like Catalyst Connection, CMTC, Fuse Hub, and Impact Washington are, uh, are working with. You know, there's a lot of different resources such as working groups or provider networks uh, to help you navigate, uh, you know, exploring robotics or other technologies. A lot of times there's grant funding that may be available, training or conduits to, to ARM and other institutes. Um, in addition to project services that are frequently offered in, this, in the, especially towards the, the front end of a project, assessments, 
uh, application evaluations or even helping you walk through uh, the range and bringing forth uh, proposals from different uh, integrators in your area uh, and just helping you navigate that, that whole process. So definitely something to consider. So with that said, you know, if any of these opportunities look familiar, uh, please reach out to us. Uh, we've got contact information for, for Reminder and myself, along with two of our, our colleagues in New York and Washington, uh, up on the screen. And if you happen to be from another area outside of one of these four uh, states, you know, there's a link also to go to the, the NIST MEP website and identify you know, what MEP is, is close to you. Or, you know, if all else fails, certainly feel free to reach out to us and we can help you as well. Um, so with that said, you know, we'll take a look here and, and see what questions we have. Okay, so let's see, we've got uh, about the uh, pricing uh, consideration. Let's see if we in, in universal, yeah, universal robots, you know, you certainly see those a lot in uh, most trade shows. Pretty much anywhere, regional, national, uh, you see them in the 20,000 plus range. You know, it's uh, pretty from their smallest end is I think typically about 20 to 30, upwards of 45 to 50 or more now that they have the UR16, uh, 16 kilogram unit. Um, but this individual indicates they had uh, saw a, a much more inexpensive robot. Um, let's see, robotics. Robots at 1,100 of it, you need an engineer to assemble uh, different parts. And as I say, essentially, are you seeing the cost of cobots coming down? You know, what sort of comments do you have? Well, what have you seen, Reminder? Uh, yeah, the cobot and robot pricing is coming down. Now, there's there are scare robots. Epson makes a scare robot. It's a $9,000 scare robot. It's a very low payload. It's about a pound, two pound payload robot. It's a small reach. Um, it's a very robust and reliable. That's another 50,000 uh, hours design life robot. Um, you know, I don't necessarily want to limit the talk to cobots, uh, but they, whether we talk about whether we're thinking of cobots or uh, traditional robots, prices are continuing to drop. Um, so they are for the more for typical applications, a standard sized cobot, like say a universal size, you know, they start at three kilogram payloads and I guess they're up around, what did you say, Matt? Now there's 15, there's a 15 kilogram payload one. Uh, yeah. Those are in the 30, yeah, those are in the 30, $35,000 price range and then they go up from there. Uh, but we are seeing some new entries, some startups, uh, some smaller companies, uh, there's, that are introducing cobots and robots at the sub twenty thousand dollars, so it's in the ten to twenty thousand dollar price range. So it is happening as the technology matures. We're, we are seeing uh, pricing continue to fall. Uh, it, you, you do still have to consider the other implementation costs, and um, I, I think despite what uh, the cobot manufacturers say about ease of use and that you don't need as much in terms of safety cages and light curtains and other things around the robot. We're still looking at least a 2x or a 3x uh, factor once it's all installed and programmed and, and ready to run. Okay, so I think we have uh, any other questions, Allie? Mm -mm. Oh, let's see. Uh, someone asked if a copy of the presentation will be available. And yes, here in the coming days, we'll distribute a copy to all the, the registrants. And there will also be a recording I mean, coming out in that same email, right? The, mm -hmm. A recording of uh, the session if uh, you missed any of it. Uh, so that will be sent out to all the all the registrants. And we'll also be posted on, on most of our uh, MEP website, our Catalyst website. We'll have a link there as well. Uh, let's see here. Are you aware of any robots used in the chemical processing metal finishing industry? Let's see. Chemical processing, I don't know if they're referring, I know there's some chemical machining processes. It depends if that's what's being referred to here. Um, but does that the uh, chemical processing metal finishing industry, uh, some sort of, do uh, you have an, an idea on that, Reminder? Uh, they're uh, plating uh, and there are. Okay. They clarify plating and anodizing. 
So I was like, dipping yeah. So it would be a pick and place type of application where you're typically dipping parts into a bath, um, a chemical bath. And so yeah, you know that would be an articulated arm, typically, or it could be, mm, you know, actually any of the mechanisms, even a Cartesian, or possibly a Scara. Uh, but uh, yeah, most likely that would be an articulated arm application. So yep, there are cases of that. Um, the main consideration is end effector design. Um, you know, there are wash down, for example, there are wash down robots that have that are used a lot in in a food processing where you have positive air pressure in on the inside of the robot so that you can completely wash down the robot and without damaging it at all. So uh, that would be a potential robot uh, mechanism that you would use in for for uh, you know if you're talking about chemical finishing the parts. Okay. Well, I think that uh, looks like uh, all the the questions that have come in here. Uh, so again, you know, we're just about the, the top of the hour. So thanks everyone for oh, one more. How about assisting racking parts? Uh, and that was with that same application um, of plating and, and anodizing. And I think you know certainly it, it's obviously you know, hard without uh, seeing the, the application, but of racking parts, I you know taking things that are coming, whether it's down a, a conveyor or transferring from some other uh, process or other tooling, you know, to place parts in a known location. I mean, a lot, you see a lot of them used in the, the powdered metal industry for feeding furnaces, having parts coming down a conveyor and either putting them, or in ceramics, putting them in, in saggers to go through a furnace. Uh, so I think certainly uh, the assisting, you know, and if that's implying working with a, a human operator, uh, there's you know, a lot of work going on in that space uh, as well, uh, but certainly more development to come there. Yeah, and I think the main thing, as we mentioned earlier, for racking the parts is going to be the end effector design. There, you know, you'd most likely again go with an articulated arm. So the robot mechanism is there. You have a wide variety of sizes and payloads to choose from. It's just a matter of getting the correct gripper design so that you can handle uh, the largest number of parts. You know, if you have a high mix of uh, production parts, you're going to have to be very clever with your end effector design or do quick change end effectors so that you can. Uh, adequately pick and place all the parts that you wanted to rack. Yep, absolutely. All right, well, thank you, uh, Reminder, for, for joining me this afternoon to go through Thanks, this man. webinar, and thank you to all those on the line for registering, and um, I hope everyone has a great afternoon. We'll be sending things out shortly. Yeah. Thanks again. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we, we really love, we're real nerds when it comes to robots. We can talk about this all day, so we appreciate the opportunity to speak on this and we thank you all for attending.